So we are very glad that you are here, and I think it's uh, very nice that we have here our two guests, uh, Josep Ricard from H Architects and Jose Toral from Paris Toral, who are going to be the participants in this dialogue. They are very well known uh, in, their, in their practice, and uh, by not only here in, in Barcelona, Catalonia, but also internationally. So uh, which I think uh, the reason why they are here both is that the architectural practice is outstanding in, 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 the, in the field of housing, uh, there are uh, a reference at the moment in the discussion of what is a uh, social housing in, in, in Spain and how to address in Spain and internationally how to address this topic. So that's why we invited them here to discuss with them um, different approaches of contemporary housing regarding particularly social housing. So um, in order to uh, explain what we are, how we are going to run the, the session, I will first give an introduction to Riduel. Riduel, what for those of you who are coming from the uh, students who are coming to the conference. And then I will just try to um, put on the air some ideas, some concepts about social housing that are important, we believe, in the research we are doing in Ridwell. Then we will have uh, the intervention from Josep Ricard, around half an hour or a bit more, and then Jose Toral. And then at the end, we'll have a dialogue between you and the audience here, sitting here. We'll put the screen up, and then you have all the states. And we expect uh, your questions. We you expect uh, that this dialogue is between all of you, so it's uh, open to all your questions. So it will be an open dialogue, and we are ready for receiving your questions at the end. So let's start with, uh, with the sequence then. Um, first of all, let's start uh, going from the most generic things to the redwell and then to the discussion itself. This is a sentence, a statement that you see everywhere. There's a lack of affordable housing, and you look around, and you look at uh, newspapers from Spain, from UK, from Germany, from the Netherlands, and you can see statements that could be exchanged. In the UK, they said that the government must invest in building new social homes, but this sentence could be also written in a Spanish newspaper. In Berlin, we read that uh, rents on Berlin housing market continue to rise. And this could be also in the state of Berlin, we could write here in Barcelona, and also will work the same way. Also in the Netherlands, a shocking housing shortage in high house prices. How do you come to this? We're trying to understand the situation. And this situation is the same in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Spain. We can say that it's an international global phenomenon in Europe. But there's also another parallel issue, which is also everywhere, which is the climate change. And again, if we look at the media, the news, these are recent news, we see that it's an European problem, and it's not only just a matter of mitigation, it's also a matter of protection because there are already damages in the health of people in the way we have to transform our buildings and our cities in order to survive, not only a matter of mitigating, but also just protecting ourselves. And news from the New York Times about how in the New York uh, neighborhoods they are addressing this and through the climate change issues, are, they are discovering other kind of problems. They are discovering that the neighborhoods that are more affected are the ones that have more immigrants, people that are non-English speakers, people that are from different uh, non-white races. So climate change is bringing to the surface problems that have nothing to do with climate, have to do with social issues, economical issues, integration. And the other document you see here is, is from the French government, and it's a report about housing related to the sustainable development goals. Both things are related. So this is important because it's a document from a government, from the French uh, state, that is relating both things. So they are connecting housing and the problems we have with housing with sustainable development goals. They are related. So uh, we hear uh, continuously the expression, uh, the problem of housing. But problem of housing are indeed many problems. And the question is not just to provide uh, 500,000 units, whatever they need it. It's, that's the, the quick answer to the problem. The real issue is to define the problem before we try to find the solutions. And uh, some recent uh, developments go in, uh, particularly in that direction, to define it, to understand the problem first before we provide solutions that are purely building. So this is document that you see here is from uh, a meeting of ministers, European ministers from two years ago, discussing the European, uh, the housing shortage from a European perspective. And the statement of this document, when they start, they say, we have a common challenge. So it's not only a problem of a particular country, it's a European challenge. And the challenge, how it's described here, is producing affordable, sustainable, and then more words, decent and resilient housing. 
it's interesting to see that affordable and sustainable are followed by decent, like uh, suggesting that maybe not all affordable housing is decent. And that's something very important when it comes to a, a document coming from uh, politicians, from ministers. They are recognition that it's not only a matter of providing housing that is cheap, it's also a matter of decent and quality of life. So the word quality also appears in this document. We need to provide homes of good quality. And this, again, I insist, is from a meeting of ministers responsible for housing at the European level. And not only housing as a isolated objects, housing that is well integrated into the right environment. So they talk about situated in mixed use environments, compact in dense areas, high quality living environment, close to working areas. Also, they talk about the qualitative spatial efficiency, the integration with the urban development. So we have not, the solution is not only just to build houses anywhere, but to see it in the context of urban development with a sustainable approach. And it's not only about building new housing, it's also about renovating existing housing, which is indeed a big challenge in itself. And uh, at the end, they close with this statement that what we need is affordable, well-connected, decent, energy efficient, decarbonized, sustainable design, accessible and resilient housing situated in socially mixed neighborhoods. Uh, any urban planner or this discussion and this statement could be signed by many of us here. Uh, many urban planners, architects, and everybody involved in, in provision of affordable housing would agree that really this is the way to address it. The question is how to do it and who will do it. This, were, uh, this project, this uh, network, mm, this Marie Curie network really well uh, fits into this story. What we are doing in this Marie Curie project network is to train future professionals that are able to understand the complex issue of affordable sustainable housing from a holistic perspective, that are able to talk to other experts from other fields in order to address properly the problem of affordable sustainable housing. It's a transdisciplinary approach that means basically that we are training experts to be able to talk to experts to other disciplines, but also training professionals that are able to talk to non-professionals. So that's the idea of transdisciplinarity. What we have done in this Ridwell project in these three years in Ridwell is uh, now in the third and final year, there are 15 PhD candidates doing their thesis in parallel from 10 universities, and there are 13 partner organizations collaborating providing secondments for this research. And in this project as well, we have done along these th three years, six training courses, three workshops, three summer schools, two international conferences, this is the second one. And in this collaborative work, we have created a knowledge base, all together a transdisciplinary knowledge base through a vocabulary, case studies, library, challenges that are being defined by all the theses, publications, etc. So now about the title of this session. In the program of the conference, we have put this title to this uh, session, Rethinking Dwelling, Reimagining uh, Housing. I'm going to try to explain why these words are here. So in its more primordial sense, housing is a basic instinctive act. It's the result of our innate need for protection from nature. In this regard, a house could be defined as a defensive act. But a house is more than a shelter. It's also a manifestation of our way of being in the world, individually and collectively. This text, uh, Building Dwelling Thinking, is now in two posters around the schools. I guess that many students are familiar already with this text because it has become, for some reason, very popular this academic year. It's a classic text, uh, a reference for many generations of architects. It's a lecture that Martin Heidegger gave uh, to architects, planners, but also politicians that were there in the speech in 1951. That means six years after the end of the Second World War. And who was, uh, this is an, an, an article uh, text that contains many inspiring ideas, not always very easy to understand, but there are some things that can be clearly understood and they're still valid. One of them is the distinction between housing and dwelling. They are not the same things. And writing in 1951 and talking to a country that was still in ruins, where shelter was very necessary, Heidegger was reminding to politicians, to architects, engineers, that housing is not dwelling. He was saying that today's houses may be well planned, easy to keep, attractively cheap, open to air, light and sun, but do the houses in themselves hold the guarantee that dwelling occurs in them? 
And he makes a turn in the arguments. In common sense, in order to dwell, we have to first to build. You want to provide a shelter, a housing, we need to first build the house. And what Heidegger is saying in this text is the other way around. We first need to dwell, to know how to dwell in the world, and then we are able to build. First dwelling and then uh, building. A house uh, houses us. And I can house you, but I cannot dwell you. Dwelling is inseparable for being. Dwelling is being in space and time. It's the, that sign to be there. Space and experience are together. Living is living in space. A house becomes a home as it becomes our place, the space we live in, where to dwell on our experiences, ideas, and emotions. The boundaries of the house do not confine the space we inhabit, the lived space. While walls may delineate an inner space, the experience of dwelling extends beyond these confines. We live in a spatial continuum, as Perret said, to live is to pass from one space to another while doing your best not to bump yourself. Continuing the house as a physical structure, there's an inside and outside space. From the perspective of dwelling, there are no clear limits between inner and outer space, between house and city and territory. So we have nowadays uh, a crisis, a shortage, but also an opportunity to, to rethink the way we dwell, not only the way we build, the way we dwell, rethinking dwelling. And it's rethinking, re RE, the prefix means again, again in a different way, and also back to the way things were before, to look for some essence, some origin. So rethinking means all of this, to think again in a different way from our perspective to an issue like dwelling that has been always there. And also imagining housing involves perpetual evolution and a constant dialogue between past and present. Housing is continuously reimagined. Now, uh, the last part of this, letting things on the air only, uh, connects to the, what comes next. And these are the terms that uh, preparing this uh, dialogue um, we propose to discuss here and will be then uh, addressed by Josep and by Jose in their own way related to their own experience and their own work. I will only give here some um, starting points. So. Today, it's not only a matter of reinventing, innovating housing. We know what housing is. We know what housing needs are. What we need to know is to find a balance between opposite poles. Now, the discussion about contemporary housing is the result of tensions between opposite poles that need to be superseded in order to find a balance, a reconciliation between them. Tradition versus innovation, materiality versus immateriality, intimacy versus community, nature versus artifice, and you could continue with the list. Today, talking about housing, there is on the one hand a growing movement towards recovering and reevaluating traditional housing models that have proven to be cost effective, culturally appropriate, and environmentally sustainable over time. We are now appreciating again vernacular architecture, particularly in housing. So there is a trend that is reflected also in the contemporary work. On the other extreme, we have to innovate. We have to innovate for developing more sustainable materials, implementing circular construction practices, and utilizing renewable energy sources. We have to find a balance between the two tensions, a continuity between past and present housing based on fundamental, special, rather than visual qualities, continuous adaptation of existing housing to current needs. To the other position, materiality versus immateriality. If we look at immateriality, the immaterial qualities of contemporary housing, we see a renovated sensitivity about the impact of materials on spatial qualities and the feeling of space, comfort and well-being of the inhabitants. But with regard to materiality, we see a return to the basic principles of architecture and construction, to the quality of materials and to the process of production. To find a balance between these two poles means an increased quality of the lift spaces to create resilient, inclusive, and equitable built environments. Intimacy versus community. We see nowadays that intimacy is changing. In housing, is still a need for privacy, for personal space, also for a sense of belonging within your home, and also a sense of intimacy that is changing alongside the new interactions through digital media and also multiple forms of habitation. On the other hand, compensating this trend towards individuality and intimacy, we have 
that uh, in housing is very important to foster the social connections, share experiences in collective spaces, couriers, communal gardens, that foster interaction and the sense of belonging among residents. How to reconcile these two trends means to redefine the notion of public and private realms in buildings and in cities, fostering in between spaces. And the final one, nature versus artifice. We see now an increased awareness of limited resources and the environmental damage of constructions. This prompts us to live in harmony with natural systems and respecting the intrinsic value of biodiversity and ecosystems. On the other hand, our world is more and more artificial. We are using technology to produce renewable energies, new materials, also digital technologies to make buildings more efficient in the design and the use. How to reconcile, bring together these two poles means adopting circular construction principles, using natural and renewable materials, integrating building in the environment and renaturalizing cities. I will now uh, introduce our two guests that will continue with the session. First of all, uh, Joseph Ricard from H Architects and then Jose Toral, Peris Toral. Joseph Ricard uh, earned his degree in architecture from the School of Architecture in Le Valles here in Barcelona in 1999. And then uh, he founded the, the office H Architect, Arc Architectures, together with uh, the partners. And they are located in South Asia in Barcelona. Their work has received uh, recognition and awards for the projects and also designs, including the Miss van der Rohe finalist in 2017 for House in Granada Years, among many others. Their projects have been featured in numerous national and international publications, exhibitions, and they have been invited speakers internationally. And he, Josep is also teaching at the school that we were yesterday uh, since 2006, the school where he got his degree. And Jose Toral he graduated from the School of Architecture here in Barcelona. Um, in 2003, he founded uh, the studio in 2005 with uh, Marta Peris. And uh, their work focused very much on social housing, as we will see today. And they also have received uh, many recognitions, international awards, and also a Miss van der Rohe finalist award in 2022. He's also teaching uh, the School of Architecture, where he got the degree. So uh, I would like now to give the word to Josep, and let's see. Thank you for coming, both of you. Okay. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I will try to keep in my half of hour, and maybe later we can go deeper in the issues that we present this afternoon. Uh, of course, that I will talk about architecture in general, but I will try to follow the the topics that uh, Leandro has presented before, and I will use examples based in dealing into affordable houses or social housing. About the, I mean, of course that I've done my own interpretation how we, uh, how we are concerned about the topics that Leandro has presented, and, and for sure that after he present me and send me the, the four uh, issues, I found myself really, um, I appreciate that there's a lot, uh, th it's a lot to do with the way that we uh, approach to our projects in architecture. But traditional innovation for me is uh, our approach to that concept is very based in the really origin of the office. I mean, we are four people working together since we were like uh, 19 years old. And it's impossible to work as a team if you don't have that kind of shared common places, easy to be shared between for different people that has own desires. And in that sense, uh, the vernacular, it's been always from the very beginning of the office, uh, one of these common places, easy to be sure, a way for any kind of representative architecture and very based on the efficiency and utility and sense of availability of the vernacular. But during those years, we have discovered that uh, vernacular is not, ju is not is just not something that happened in the past. It's something related to the past. It's something that happened already today in different ways. Uh, maybe as what Jacques Ferrier called like uh, contemporary vernacular. Something that happens in this beautiful picture sent to me by, a, by an older student that show that uh, these origins of the office uh, concerned about that kind of traditional vernacular or what 
everybody can understand as vernacular. And how now we have discovered that we are real, what really interests to us from vernacular is not just that sense of memory, but that sense of efficiency, that sense of availability, uh, construction based on to be aware about what is available in our surrounding. Um, it's also important to us, uh, the way that we uh, approach our projects, is that idea of interdependency between context and uh, constructive decisions, uh, between uh, nature, physical, uh, social context, and what we design in order to provide an experience to, to human beings. And context, in that sense, is all also uh, not only the obvious context, but also that uh, same idea of availability. Um, to, to explain a little bit how we deal in that, uh, in that idea, which is uh, the idea of availability understood as something that is also related with the past, trying to understand uh, constructive traditions, but also related to present and future in order to, to admit, like in the synchronism process in, in Sintoist tradition, which is to repeat again a, a, traditional, uh, a traditional event, but accepting that we have new tools, new elements, new, uh, even new technologies, to do this combination between between uh, tradition and, and and modernity and contemporary demand, um, this is a house. Uh, just to explain uh, uh, an example of of, of uh, social housing. Well, uh, an elderly uh, dwelling we're doing in in Mallorca. But uh, to introduce the the dwelling, I just want to explain very fast. And a, a house that we did in in Lampurda, in Ullastret. It's a house, it's a, it's a village defined, very well defined by this kind of beautiful stone walls. And the house, well, it's, it's not about to talk about this typology, but the, the strategy in this house was to uh, use the former wall that defines the plot in order to do a, an attached house uh, to this uh, former beautiful wall made, uh, made of a stone in order to provide that continuous porch uh, working as a, as a house surrounding the beautiful uh, uh, courtyard and so on. Uh, the thing is that, that for uh, norms uh, from the council, it's not very important. But this former wall has to be this former wall has to be demolished because the street was too narrow for the cars. So in front of this dramatic situation, uh, the way that we approach to heritage in all our projects is not about a before to ask to the project in terms of uh, cultural and compositional uh, and composition um, terms, we, we try to, to find out into the heritage if the heritage is still able to perform in order to help us for the new attributes that architecture is asked for for the, for the, for the users. So in this case that the wall, which, is, which was the real heritage in this plot, has to disappear, we didn't ask to the wall, but we asked to the stones if the stones were still able to perform in order to help to the future house. So, so this house is interesting in that sense, that we demolish the wall because it has to be demolished, but we reuse the stones in order to, to produce a new kind of wall in a rameter technique, but uh, based in a cyclopic concrete. It's a concrete without any kind of steel bars, made with uh, lime mortar, okay, uh, mix it with... Uh, with insufflated air glass balls that gives uh, that gives less density to the wall in order that with 60 centimeters wide wall the insulation was enough just with one layer technology so it's a house made with just one layer technology wall okay that performs as a structural element as a geometrical element that defines the the spaces as an insulation is not an incredible insulation but it's enough in order to be into the norms with an incredible amount of inertia to, to give a temperate condition to the indoor uh, uh, spaces. Well, well, this is a technology. The, it's, uh, the final moment is to, to dig over the surface in order to show again the stones, because we are asked to show the stones. In that kind of, of village, you've been asked to show uh, the stones in what we call crocanti, in that kind of fake uh, facades just to show the stone, but in our case, was the real stone performing as a real element in terms of a structure? Well, and it's also very beautiful. But I just want to show. Well, this is the. I mean, I think that what is 
the at least is our opinion to to work with the context in terms of of vernacular in that kind of surrounding to be really in fit in this context is not to look like the stone but to perform like the traditional construction perform okay so i think that it's completely well placed in this village it doesn't matter the color and the color will be in 50 years for sure basically the same but it's about that the house work in a bearing wall uh, technology, uh, lo structural logic as the former houses and so on and so on. Well, this is just an introduction to explain you uh, social housing that we are doing in Palma de Mallorca. This is a dwelling for elderly people. It's, it's a result of a competition for, for Ibabi. I suppose that Jose Manuel will explain you also some Ibabi examples. Um, uh, this is something that is uh, not finished, but in this case, it's related to the previous, but in a little bit different way. Well, in Mallorca, it's quite interesting because uh, I think that till the 80s, we're still able to build in Mallorca just with pure stone because it was more available, the Mares stone, this kind of, uh, of limestone that they have in all the quarries in Mallorca. It was the, the available stuff in Mallorca till the 80s well, was basically this kind of product. So even the the existing the pre-existing construction that was in the in the plot for the competition which was a very humble school from the 70s was built in that kind of a stone so uh, we won the competition just with a very simple scheme that was to demolish the school and use all those uh, uh, stone elements that was from the very thinner uh, wall to the wider wall was made in 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 Mares stone to demolish it and to rebuild it in the form of a uh, very heavy blocks and to rebuild it because the one of the big pros of the of the administration in this competition was that they were so uh, excellent that it was not necessary to use all the surface uh, previewed in the norm so you were free uh, there was a lot of free space in the plot. So we decided that instead of have a bigger garden, to have bigger walls, to have more inertia in order to give, to provide better comfort condition just in a very natural and very passive way. So the, the difference between this, this, this drawing is from the competition. This is also drawing from the competition. It's very, very basic. Um, bearing walls uh, logic uh, performance okay because there's no there's no uh, rigid uh, joint between the the slabs and the on the vertical wall the wall works just for gravity the slabs doesn't transmit any kind of, of flexion to the walls and uh, because the wall as is just made b with blocks and there's no steel bars cannot work at flexion so it has to be as heavy as possible because there's no uh, flexion possible so uh, that's the process, but what we complete with the process in order to do that, that way to, 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 to improve traditions, let's say, was to see how to make it as, as efficient as possible in order to provide and to produce these blocks. So instead of do block by block, we did that, uh, we did that big stream, uh, that big uh, pools uh, that has the, the volume equal to a track uh, providing the mortar that we need to to do the to do the blocks, and uh, the good point of that process is that then with that kind of typical query tools uh, of cutting query tools was possible not or not only to do the blocks, but to recover the, the 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 look of the real stone because if not the only look that you have was the mortar that uh, that produces the, the 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 mortar block. Okay, so. It's not only, of course, that it's about efficiency, it's about uh, the sense of availability, but it's also about the sense of beautiful. I mean, it's also about the sense of memory in terms of how it looks. And to the idea that we mm, practice in all our projects, that idea to, to put a human being in a situation of interdependency between construction and context, context is also the memory of the stone. Context is also time in terms of geological time. So to show the stone is not only important in a snob way to show how I how I build, but to to put people in in touch with with time. So this is how we manage the blocks. 
uh, this is the well the, the plan is as simple and as tough as this uh, and we work like Egyptian style we say okay. this is more or less uh, like one month ago one month ago okay um, the second uh, issue Leandro has presented to talk about materiality and immateriality. I um, mean, there's a concept uh, from uh, Gilles Deleuze. Gilles Deleuze presents the difference between philosophers and artists. A philosopher is the one who produces, who creates concepts. The artist is the one who creates or who should create percepts. What is a percept? It's not exactly a perception. It's that group of perception that survives, that overlives the subject that fills the 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 perception my explanation of that mean that what we as architects or as artists we have to project is not the object but the experience of the object okay uh, to to project the experience mean to project the perceptions of course that the perception is something th that happened to the human being but we as creators as designers we are projecting previewing this experience but how we design this experience? By designing conditions by, and by taking such a simple decisions as geometry and matter. That's all we decide as architects. Geometry and matter, nothing else, in order to project the experience of human being. But that's the very basic. So that's my approach to the, to the proposal from Leandro. The relation between the experience and the uh, design in terms of uh, of matter and geometry. Uh, this is a this is a beautiful experience in a real quarry in Mallorca. Like 20 years ago, we were invited to Mallorca by people like Thifu and another like them, and they lead us to Luc Major. I don't know where is that amazing quarry, real quarry, where people still were working at the moment of the picture. I don't know if nowadays they are still there, taking off the the same stone that I've shown you in the previous school. Uh, 18 years ago, when we began to be concerned about uh, sustainab sustainable issue, uh, we were absolutely lucky people. Why? Be because at this very beginning that we were concerned because uh, my partner, for example, he was teaching here with some people that they were really on that uh, mood to, to, to a different approach from architecture to sustainability. Um, and we began to be concerned about that. I introduced that uh, approach to our projects. The lucky part was th it was at the same moment of the financial crisis in Europe. So what it was very lucky for us because our clients have not budget enough to solve the sustainable um, responsibility with very efficient machines. And our fees was not high enough to pay for sophisticated simulations. So the only way to approach sustainability from, from our position was by taking just very architectonical decisions. Architectonical decisions in terms of passive strategies and of course, biospherical materials, okay? So this very bold, simple and architectonical possible decisions was the only way that we got at that moment to approach in a environmental responsibility our projects at this moment. And was at this moment, like uh, 15 years ago, 17 years ago, that, that we did two houses, okay? Two, two affordable houses, because it was at that very uh, critical moment in, in European finance. And it's, it, looks like a, it looks like a game, but it was just a coincidence. For different reasons, we check, we check at the very basic moment, at the very same moment, two complete different technologies in a bearing wall system, but with CLT in one case and with uh, bricks and masonry in the second case. It, it's basically the same size, small houses, single family small houses. In one side, we, we check the CLT systems in a, in a plot that as you can see, you can do a ski resort or, or maybe that kind of technology was the only possible way. The only possible way to use bearing walls in that kind of plot was by using walls able to work at flexion as a CLT panel is possible too. So that's why you use that technology, not for a 
of course that it was also involved that idea of biospherical uh, uh, products and the CLT panels, bubble house. And in that sense, uh, the, the conditions in terms of availability was completely different. This is a flat plot. It's completely different for working. So in that case, we tried to do completely the opposite. In the previous example, the availability is a concept of uh, economical availability, okay? Uh, very fast to be built, uh, non-financial uh, problems, because you build a house in basically one month, uh, you hardly have to ask for the mortgage, it's a short mortgage and so on. It can work at flexion because of the plot and so on. But in this case, we check with a completely different kind of availability, a traditional availability. What the masonry of the village is able to, be, to build. So he was able to build bearing walls with bricks and just like that, okay? So, I mean, the, well, it, it was also a, qu a question of the crisis. We did all this uh, dry process in order to make it as smaller as possible, but this is not important. The important is that at the same moment, we check we, for two different affordable situations, uh, two different kind of technologies based on the bearing wall uh, concept. Uh, now, we are not in that situation of what is affordable, but we're still working in the same concept of uh, bearing walls, checking different products and so on. But, but 18 years ago, I don't know, I, I, in fact, I'm, I think that it has changed a little bit, okay? But 18 years ago, the cheapest way to build in this case was the availability concept based in geography, okay? What is available in terms of what is close to me, okay? They were the, they were the winner in terms of cost, okay? Today, but uh, it's, it's, it's important to say that 18 years ago, in terms of CLT panels production, there was a very lack of competence here in Spain. The only way to get that was to bring it from Austria, KLG, uh, K KLH, okay? And people from Soria coming here to build up the house. Uh, it has changed a lot. Now we are using far more CLT panels and it's, I think it's still a little bit more affordable that, but if you compare it in terms of finance, it's, I think it's more efficient, the CLT systems, okay? Well, this is a more contemporary example that we are dealing with. Okay, the, the third concept about intimacy and community. This is the only concept that I think, I, I don't exactly agree with the dual approach that Leandro has presented. For me, in fact, th those concept is more based about how we make it larger, the distance, the gap, between the maximum intimacy and the maximum community. I mean, both concepts have to be together, but as, as larger is the gap, as more sophisticated and better is the experience uh, in, in the in-between. Um, well, uh, some of you were yesterday visiting this uh, building, the, the social, uh, the, the the housing for students in the at the university, well, at the architectural school, we did this project with Data E, Claudi and and Albert. Um, and yeah, um, I mean, I think it's interesting to talk about this building in that sense of, I mean, it's something that I ask a lot to my students in the projects when we work with housings or whatever to. I ask just like a pure rule, okay, I ask you to do at least seven uh, different Ders Halls episodes from the very, very uh, public space to the very, very intimate space, okay? It's just like a big rule. It could be seven, it could be nine, doesn't matter, it could be three, okay? But the idea is to ask them to, to check, to, to research about how to develop that all those transitions from the very, very public to the very, very intimate, okay? But, uh, and this is quite architectonical understandable. But what is interesting from this building, which was a competition, was a different idea of what means community or what means 
in that sense, this is about to talk about community, but it's also to talk about urban metabolism, okay? We won this competition by explaining to the, to the jury that it was a little bit uh, that, that the building, the relation between the building and the community, first of all, it was a metabolical issue. I mean, why uh, I have to do a tank, wh why, I have to, uh, why I have to recover rainwater when I have a huge roof of the former architectonic, uh, uh, architectural school just uh, close to me. Why I have to give uh, f um, studio program, gym program, uh, social program to the people who lives in the dueling when they have a studio, cafeteria, uh, coffee shop uh, in the existing building. Why I have to produce my own heating energy when I have an incredible huge uh, boil machine in the existing uh, school. And this is a more clear example, when the school is open and the heating system is needed is during the day. Uh, the, the student residents need the heating system during the night, so it was a no sense to ask, and it was asked in the competition, of course, to have a studios for people studying, to have a gym for uh, leisure and so on. So we won, basically, because we didn't waste uh, a space for the social, and we put the maximum number of housing units. So we win, we won because in the jury was the promoter and the manager of the future housing residents. But I still think that this is a metabolical re re reflection, absolutely necessary before to do any kind of design decisions in terms of social space transitions and so on. And of course, after that, there's as much as possible numbers of their schools of transition spaces uh, between or from the most public and social uh, spaces to the most intimate. Okay, well, from the campus, you come into the you come into the section. The section admits that with this uh, double possible access, the, the the building doesn't need elevator, which is a cheaper building. So that's also a reason that why we won. Uh, you come into that, uh, uh, not social, but uh, community space shared by only the users and the people who live into the, into the housing. And then like small decisions like to make this corridor, this continuous terrace, which is the access to the apartments, 50 centimeters wider than the minimum asked per law. A wide enough to introduce a very small table to produce this extra uh, episode between to come into the apartment. Well, the building is basically a support, a support for, for uh, vegetation, a support for, 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 for very, well, it was a construction process based in prefabrication. Well, this is not Absolutely interesting, but is the condition of the competition too. We, we were asked to use this kind of prefabricated system. Uh, quite interesting, but basically what we did is was to take as maximum as advantage as, as possible from the, from the system itself by developing with the engineers of the prefabricated systems how we can make it the system better in order to let all the surfaces completely uncoated, completely and, and protected to show the real the real material of the of the model okay of the unit which is a concrete system well very fast of building and so on okay so the, the kitchen is an example of the same we basically we have designed the support of living we have designed a support for make better conditions for vegetation, and we have designed non, not a kitchen, or not exactly a kitchen, but just as a support. People who visited it yesterday, I think that can tell you that this picture is from 10 years ago, maybe, or 12 years ago. The, the kitchen is basically in very good conditions because it's quite tough, it's quite resistant, but the real kitchen is not like that. The real kitchen is like that, which is far more beautiful, okay? So, because basically what we have designed is like that. Well, in fact, uh, well, Laia is from the school, maybe she, she remember, but when we just finished the building, I will not show you any picture about how was the building just finished. People was known between the students as Guantanamo, which is not a very good name, okay? 
because it was very tough, it was very dry, the vegetation was not already there, so it was all the fence, all the railings surrounding the building, so because it was so tough. Now I don't know the bad name of the building, maybe it's, I don't know, the messy building or the messy place, but, but okay, uh, life is happening in, in, over, into the support that we have designed, okay? The experience has been developed and as well, I forgot, there's a very beautiful sentence from Peter Brook, the, the theater, the dramaturg, okay? Peter Brook says something like the, when theater is a convincing, it's a convincing perform, then the invisible uh, shows up, the invisible turns visible, okay? So what is, and in architecture, there's a lot of things that are invisible, but exist, and invisible is also temperature. Invisible is noise, invisible is smell, okay? And this is very part of the experience. Of course, that Peter Brook, it's, it was talking about something more abstract, but I really like to, to imagine that to, to project this experience is not just talking about the visual experience, it's also talking about how we really preview all the perceptual systems that we have to perceive and to, and to be into architecture. Okay, so it's the same with the space. The space is basically empty, showing all those, uh, all those surfaces of the prefabricated system. And the people, and you have to remember that this is architectural students like you are, so we ask, and, and this is also another reason why we won the competition. We really unfinished the indoor space, and it was a challenge for the people who lives there to do a final development about how to divide the spaces using some furnitures, and, and so on. Okay, and the same with the facade. We thought the wisteria was Guantanamo. The people who saw yesterday this facade can say you that it's completely green and beautiful, I hope, and so on. Okay, and the, and the fourth and final issue about uh, nature and artifice. And, and to talk about that, I use this beautiful painting from Ramon Casas. The, you can see this painting in the Thyssen in Madrid, and uh, the painting itself is a real manifesto, okay? The title of this painting, I discovered it later, I began to use the painting for to show or to, because it's such a beautiful moment, such a beautiful experience, that you can use it for whatever you want, okay? So we can use it for nature and artifice. But the beautiful is that the title of the, of the painting is an indoor outdoor. Un interior al exterior, or something like that. It's quite similar to that, which, which is a manifesto. I mean, it's, it's, it's saying something that, from the point of view of the, of, the, of the painter, this is a comfortable experience as could be inside the house. Okay, so in this intermediate situation between context and geometrical and materic conditions, something happens that produce a real comfort, yeah? Well, I mean, I think it's difficult to, Im to don't buy the moment of that, of that guy, okay? Sh yeah, well, <laughs> well sh she's, see, yeah, that's true. But we can say that there's more paintings with uh, his sister than with his brother-in-law. So, because she's the painter's sister, okay? And he's the brother-in-law. <laughs> okay, but, but yeah, I, I, I love that, pic that painting for, his title, for its title, which is very useful to talk about architecture and the way that we approach architecture, but especially because express um, part of this approach that we have, which we call uh, reciprocal architecture, which is, and to understand architecture as the result of this collaboration between uh, constructive decisions and uh, environmental conditions, natural conditions, physical phenomena, and of course to social and contextual conditions as availa available materials and so on. So to put people in an experience produced by this combination is not only sustainable, because of course that we're talking about passive strategies, available materials, and so it's sustainable for sure. But the good is that the result is, is far more uh, better than the same experience produced by artificial conditions, okay? 
the same temperature, the same, the same humidity, the same wind speed produced by artificial fan, artificial machines, artificial uh, air from HVAC systems, it's worse for sure than the moment that this guy have in this painting. Do you agree? I think it's obvious. I mean, there's nothing much to, to, to explain about that relation. Um, and and I, th I hope this section has uh, something to do with the, with the painting. This is, a, this is a social housing we've done in Gaba, not far away from here. And this is the real section of, the, of every unit, okay? Uh, one space that happens between two spaces very related with what happened outside. A continuous terrace and a continuous gallery. Okay, and nothing than, than that. So so the so the housing is a is a continuous. Well, when we do competitions, uh, one thing that we really take much care is about to do the calculation, to do the the comparison between uh, the surface uh, result of the addition of of plants of the maximum uh, footprint of the norms, just to do the multiplication plants per surface and to compare it with the maximum surface that the norms admit. Uh, I don't know out of Spain, but in Spain and Catalonia, it's never the same. I mean, there's, a, there's always a gap. Our theory is that the bigger is the gap, the more space for architectonical and strategical decisions you have. Because if you have to take off part of this volume to decide where is the, the those uh, raising moment is a, a strategical decision. In that case, what we decided was not to redefine uh, the shape of the volumes that the urban plan defines, but to take off and produce this continuous courtyard in the very middle of every bar, okay? Before to decide how it's gonna be the typology, we assume that for sure it's gonna be a better living if you have natural ventilation, natural cross ventilation, and you have double origin of natural light. So. Before to know everything of the technology of the typology, we decided that the 3,000 square meter that was the difference gonna be defined through these gaps uh, as country as courtyards. Okay, so basically the typology is that uh, is that uh, gap is that uh, continuous courtyard surrounded by three uh, levels of of of, <laughs> of spaces a continuous gallery, a continuous series of equal space of 11 square meters, which is just over the minimum for a double bedroom, okay, a double people bedroom, and a continuous terrace. Okay, that's the, that's the, that's the, the look of this continuous uh, series of spaces, absolutely equal. But there's a beautiful sentence from Jacques Zondelat, which is um, um, functionalism compromise freedom of use. When I read that, like, well, I didn't read that, uh, Coque Claret, I suppose that some of you know Coque, show it to me and explain it to me, and for me it was like a shock. So, because two principles of my, of my students' years, like functionalism, no? form fo follows function, and so on, was against in on the lat opinion with something that we also follow as a students like his flexibility, freedom, and so on. And and I think that the the synthesis of the on the lat concept is that when something is so so specialized in one function, it's very difficult to use it in very different functions. So, in that sense, I do prefer spaces not highly specialized, so are not perfect for any function but highly defined, but something which is more special, like natural light, ventilation, temperature, views, uh, human experience, a way of a specific function. So basically it looks like very, very repetitive, but what defines uh, the indoor space is more about light and ventilation, okay? Uh, the other thing in terms of typology, it's that, uh, we, we prefer to do smaller bedrooms, but to have 
wider galleries because when the gallery is 180, like in this case, admits a lot of, of complementary uses as a storage, studios, uh, seating, uh, different kind of furnitures, and also produce something that uh, people who has deal with, with typologies know for sure that in a social housing, you cannot waste more than this proportion of one staircase per four apartments per floor, okay? So because this is the maximum, I mean, less than that, it's a little bit too much luxury in terms of budget, okay? But that means that you're coming into the typology from the corner, because if you are four uh, per staircase, you, you, you're coming from the corner. In that case, the wars that produce uh, 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 what we call una tipologia pasillera, no? that you need a very large corridor to go to all the spaces, is transformed because the corridor is the best place of the house, okay? Because the, ha the, the corridor is a gallery of 180 with a lot of light, a lot of uh, ventilation, and a lot of complementary, uh, complementary furniture. This is the courtyard, and you come to the house through the gallery, and the gallery is completely open to those continuous series of, of equal spaces, and the spaces open to the outside because the windows to don't disturb the furniture or the curtains open in the outside direction and you go out to your 150 continuous terrace and with this and coming to the end I uh, this is the final moment of the of those typology after I don't know if seven nine or six different thresholds from the very uh, public space to the very uh, final and intimate space. And with that, I think that I've, I've been time enough. Thank you very much. Oh. OK, uh, thank you very much. Um, I will actually explain our approach to the conceptual way we approach to the project. So I didn't adapt my presentation to the concepts of Leandro, but I think maybe we can discuss them in the table. So uh, just for first, you know, and we, we are very aligned to what Leandro was saying, you know, we think uh, of uh, everything we do now has to be totally sustainable, and for us, everything has to be environmentally sustainable, no? but economically and socially sustainable. But the point is that uh, every, everything, you know, every decision that we take that it's environmentally dis uh, uh, sustainable, it is not, maybe not all the decisions are viable in the economic point of view. So only a few part of it. So uh, and not all the economical decisions that we can do and take in a project are equitable in a social point of view. So it's only a, a, a small part of it. And not all the social decisions will be bearable in an environmental point of view. So everything is totally related. And you know, only when something is viable, equitable, and bearable, it's really sustainable. So what I will explain today are the strategies that our office take in order to be able to be environmentally, social, and economic sustainable. And the point is that we don't take an, uh, the, the idea for us is not using a strategy to each one of them. So try to take a strategy that it's in the middle. So whenever we want to be environmental and economic, uh, and social, sorry, uh, we, we do, we think of uh, using these inter, uh, intermediate spaces that will have a very, uh, it will has a very inactive uh, role in the climatic uh, behavior of the building, but will also be situated in a central part of the building that will have a social role. And whenever we want to be environmental and economic, the strategy 
It's the idea of reducing. So every time, if we reduce the thickness of the elements, if we reduce the amount of layers, if we reduce uh, the CO2, if we are able to do the same with less, it will definitely cost less economically and environmentally. So for us, this idea of not doing more than necessary, reducing, it's a key point. And finally, whenever we want to be economic and social, what we do, the strategy, is the idea of sharing. Because every time we share, that means that uh, instead, you know, we're talking about housing, so uh, maybe you have 40 house uh, units, so instead of doing a decision for each one of the units, you only do it once, so it's more economic, but at the same time, this one can be better, and at the same time, you have a social feedback for the community. So it is important for us. So what I will try to explain you are these three strategies that we, we will go through some of our projects, but the main goal is for you to understand these strategies. Uh, so he, here you see the, so some of these images of uh, inter intermediate spaces, the patios, the atrios, the elevated floors, you know, the three holes. But uh, and also the other thing that we are very worried in the office is thinking of new ways of living. Because we think we are in the 21st century, we have gone after many crises, no economic crisis, um, sanitary crisis, and uh, in habitational crisis. So we think maybe the way we were living maybe was not the most optimistic way for the new kinds of family we have. So for us, rethinking the way of living, it is very important. And at the same time, maybe this has also to be related with a new way of, constru of making the construction of the building, you know, new, new materials that has, uh, are more environmentally friendly and easier. So we'll begin with this strategy to increase these intermediate spaces. So talking about this project in Ibiza, uh, th this is a project where we, we, we decided to do a project with no active systems. So that means that uh, the first idea, okay, how to do this, we have to understand uh, how to get comfort. Because the, the point is not to have an active system, but get the comfort. No? It's easy to do it without comfort. So to understand comfort, it means that uh, which are the parameters? So we maybe all we know, we, we're sure temperature is one of the elements, but there are more of them, you know, the humidity, the movement of the air, the radiation of the, ma of the material, and also the user. The, this is very important as a parameter, the behavior of the user. And we like to explain, this is a carrier secret market abacus. Carrier invented this graphica because he also invented the air conditioning. And he also, he told us that every time we are outside this green area, we have to put on his machine. But what we want to do is not to put on his machine. So we try to translate in some way these parameters into architectural elements. So if we want to talk about temperature, we can think about winter gardens. We can think about atriums whenever uh, we talk about the, the movement, their movement, we can think of the cross ventilation, the solar chimneys. We want to talk about humidity. Well, the materials with its performances, the hygroscopicity of many materials. We want to talk about radiation. We have to think of the inertia, that it's the opposite of isolation. So uh, uh, we have to do with the density and the conductivity of the materials. And finally, as I told, I taking a big, con a lot of consideration in the, into the client, and mainly, rather than understanding that or site, it's only the site plan. Maybe also the climatic card is part of our, of our site. So in this case, uh, we we have uh, well very high temperatures in summer, not too low in winter, but not too high also. So and also a very, a very big humidity over the 80%. You know, humidity in a space should be between the 50 and the 60%, okay? So um, 
in this project, okay, one of the strategies, one of, is this idea of increasing these intermediate spaces using these atriums that are covering the patios and, and also having some winter gardens in each one of the typologies, you know, in order to uh, have this, to accomplish the objectives of no systems, we orientated all the drawings facing south, you know, we capture this energy with this winter garden, and also we have a central system into the patios, okay? So this, this patio, this covering of the patio, it's not only the size of a patio, it's the, it doubles the size because we want to have also a social space. It has to be related to a social space, a space for the community, that it's a room that it's related to the common spaces of the building. So it, be, it works, you know, we, we keep the energy, uh, then we have uh, a lot of inertia, with, we have a very heavy material, so we keep this energy a very a long amount of time, and then we do a 10 centimeters isolation with cork, uh, so then we, we don't lose this inertia that we have kept, and then we, we can let this energy to take advantage of it. Here we can see the atrium and these uh, glass curtains of the winter gardens. And this is how it was supposed to work at the beginning, some of the simulations. We have 15 degrees outside. We can rise it uh, up to 23 degrees, but the problem is that we don't have a constant uh, temperature. We have this stratification of the temperature, but if we add this fan in the middle of the patio, we are able to make sure the temperatures and have this increase from this 15 degrees to 21 degrees. So we have six more degrees than the temperature that we have outside, no? And this is what's happening. This is the temperature day night outside, no? So it's, you know, it's oscillating, but the nice thing is this, this red line is the temperature inside the house with no systems. We have a constant line of 21 degrees. The point is that it is constant because we have a lot of inertia. We were using raw earth uh, blocks and but if we only have inertia, what would happen that it would be constant with the mean line of the outside temperature. But as we are able to raise temperature with the winter gardens, to raise temperature with the atrium, we can raise this mean line to a point uh, that we have this situation of comfort. Uh, one of the big challenges in Ibiza is solving the problem in the summer. So in this case, we change the, the behavior of the atrium into a solar chimney. We make some openings. We have a solar protection in the interior in, in order to increase temperature in the interior and generate some movement of the air. Also, we work uh, with the cross ventilation in all of the units. And uh, it is important also the inertia to dissipate the energy at night and also to have this regulation of humidity using the blocks of earth. So all the spaces uh, allow the air to pass, to move, so we're using lattices. And this is what's happening. This is a graphic. We are only looking at temperature. Remember, at comfort, we have more parameters. OK, what's it's happening in summer is that we have this oscillation, we are going from 23 to 30, you no know, day, night, day, night. And in this case, uh, we have, we don't have an, a totally horizontal interior temperature. We're oscillating between 26 and 27 degrees. That means that that's the reason why in the competition we used to have uh, timber uh, slabs and we change it into concrete in order to make this line more horizontal. Uh, but uh, the point is that, okay, we are talking about 26, 27 degrees. Do we have comfort at this temperature? This is something that, okay, as to analyze comfort, there is not only temperature, there are all the all other parameters. We're, we're thinking of the movement of the air. It's a very important parameter, so that's why we have this cross ventilation in all of the units, and we are changing the behavior of the 
atrium into a solar chimney to generate some movement of the air. So what is happening, you know, we put the solar protection inside. It's not obvious, but that generates an increase of the temperature, and the hot air tends to go up, and that generates a movement of the air, even though there is no movement outside. But, and we have a mean movement of the air of 2.1 meters per second. It's half meter per second means one degree of thermal feeling. So we have four less degrees of thermal feeling, but the thermometer measures the same, you know. Uh, well, and finally, this is the graphic, just the worst day of the year. So we have 29 degrees. Remember that the mean line was talking about 26, 27, with a movement of the air 1.5. Remember that the atrium was able to generate 2.1 with a humidity of the 56% because we have the earth and the proper cloth level, we are able to move the green area instead of changing the, 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 the temperature. So this is the, and then we have like only a 6% and not totally uh, uh, satisfied with the situation. So that's what they use for validating the comfort for the uh, air conditioning situations. And this strategy we're doing, we applied in many other projects. So this is social housing in Barcelona, next to La Mina. And again, it was a block with a tower. And we were able to generate a central space. So again, this will work as, a, as an atrium. We have a, a building thought for the winter, a building for the summer, and we are able to generate like this some movements of the air, but what, it, and so what are the simulations? And it would, what is important for us, so air is entering here from north and going into south, but we, it is important in this case, this materiality, in this case we're using a massive brick for its inertia, so this uh, shared space so we think this is a communal space, that's why we are placing some banks on there, but it, we don't have a heating here. It is a bioclimatic bio space, so generating this comfort into this shared space into the building. So more this idea of understanding that every time that we have an opportunity, it's a social space for the inhabitants. Okay, and this is... The this is the floor where we have outside there the terrace for the community, and we are looking forward to generate all the time these communal spaces. This is a project we just finished uh, one month ago in here in Barcelona, the 22 at, and it, it is a combination of different kinds of housing, senior housing, rental housing, housing for refugees. We won the competition because. We were the only ones that were uh, overlapping in the section, the different programs, so they are totally independent buildings. Uh, so they, they work totally, uh, each one has its own core, but they do share this idea, this atrium, this space that we are able, these five patios, no, that uh, are also uh, communal spaces uh, for the community and generating some comfort with some fans. And we are, this is a, a room that is measuring 360 by five. So it's 15 square meters for communal space. And you have some intimacy. We'll talk about this idea of the communal and the intimacy. And in this case, we were very worried of, uh, about the, the comfort. So all the, the patio, we use a material that was able to absorb all the acoustic reverberation. So if we didn't do that anything, if we lit it with concrete, we will have 5.2 seconds of reverberation. But we find uh, some plaster that we were able to go down to 0.9. So every time when we do these kinds of action, we are very concerned about, you know, that the, the, the user will open the windows because we're talking that they are gonna have this natural ventilation and being able to give them 
a good performance in acoustics. Okay, this is the the atrium. So it, this is uh, well, it's not in the in in summer. This should be open, and this is closed. And in winter, everything is closed. Okay, but it, it, the behavior is very similar to the one of Ibiza. So again, so here outside temperature, we are able to raise a bit l uh, upper. So we are able to raise up to 26 degrees. In this case, if it's too hot, it can also open in window in in winter. And the big difference is that as we are able to generate that much energy, we use this space for making the uh, to making the interchange of the ventilation into the into the unit. So all the units they make the interchange of the energy, the renovation of the air through this space. So this is making the interchange totally to the exterior. And we have like, this is the reduction of the demand of a 75% per when we do the renovation into these communal spaces. Okay, next strategy, the strategy of reducing. Okay, this is the project of Cornellà. We build it with CLT, uh, CLT structure. Uh, okay, one of the difficulties, you know, it's understanding, okay, how to do uh, a very big project of CLT uh, with timber of, so of, of housing, no communal housing. So one of the biggest difficulties is the fire. So there are two strategies. One is allowing burn the, the wood to be burned. So every centimeter we give extra, we are able to gain 30 minutes. The building, we needed 90 minutes because of the height. So that means that when we see CLT exposed in the slabs, that means they have three extra centimeters. Another strategy, we can cover it. We can cover it with plasterboards. Every plasterboard, uh, it's again 30 minutes. So to solve the facade, we add two plasterboards and we increase one centimeter the CLT of the facade. But because of that, because we, we did this plan with some crosses, in the center of the plan, we were not able to use CLT because every time we use CLT, that means that we have to increase three centimeters the wood, or we have to cover it with two plasterboards and increase one centimeter. So it's a lot of money of cost in, in timber and a lot of space that we cannot sell. That's why we, when we uh, were developing the project, we decided to change into pillars and beams. Because, because of the proportion, their own massivity, you don't need to increase the amount of timber in order to solve the, uh, the fire difficulties. And another thing we did was, okay, understanding how this idea of the rooms is working, and this is one, the, the simulation of one room with, the, with two supports. And the deformation is six millimeters, but if instead of that we do a continuous slap and we compensate moments, we can reduce into the half, three millimeters, and if we add the cantilevers inside, we can go down to one millimeter. That means that we needed more than 15 centimeters at the beginning. Finally, we only needed 12. We built it with 15 in order to have the three extra centimeters we needed for the, for the fire. So this is, here's how we see the continuity between the slabs and, and, the, and the structure. And we, we wanted to do the same with the pillars and the beam, but they don't, they, they, they cannot bring a beam of 50 meters that we have uh, the building. So that means we have to make joints. But in this case, instead of making joints where we have the support, that is where we have the higher moment, as we want to compensate moments just to reduce the amount of timber, we have to go there where the moment is zero. So that's one fifth between the distance of the supports. And that's why we decide, we make a design of this piece that allow 
the beams to pass through, and then we have another piece that allow the pillar not to affect its compression to into the beam, and then making this very, you know, it's very easy to do these kinds of joints because this joint will be an articulation. That's the easy way to build timber. So just by changing the place we do the joint, we are able to reduce the amount of timber. So for us, this is the key detail of the project. You know, this piece that allows the beams to pass and the pillar to be independent. And it is nice to understand that you are able to see the construction, but you also can see the bending moment of this product, of the of this point. So this is the final structural plan. And this is the nice thing, this idea of reducing. In the first case, this is the competition of the project. We needed 0.5 cube meters per, me per square meter. So uh, you pay uh, by cube meter of wood timber. Finally, with the same slabs, with the same facade, only 0.24 cube meters by square meters, less than the half. So it is important for you to understand that even though building with timber is sustainable, building with half of the timber is more sustainable. Uh, it is, but, but somebody under, somebody people think that as you can count timber as negative, it is better to use more timber. It is not. <laughs> it's more expensive and it is worse for the planet. Okay, and finally, this idea of reducing, going back to Ibiza, going back to this brick, uh, timber, uh, this earth blocks, this idea of the idea of humidity that we're talking between the 50 and the 60 percent. So if it's too dry, we don't have some of the defense, and it's too high, bacteria are increased. So we have, we should keep our uh, house spaces or dwelling spaces in between this humidity. So that's why when we begin the competition, we thought, okay, let's analyze different materials. Let's see how they behave. So here we analyze inertia and here hygroscopicity. Earth, timber, brick, and concrete. The best one with inertia is the concrete. It has this density of 2,300 and a very good conductivity. So it's the best one with inertia. Then we have the earth. Bricks are very good, but not that good because normally we do them perforated and they go down to here and the, the, the timber is not very good with inertia. But when we analyze hygroscopicity, it changes the way, all the way around. So we have here the concrete, we have here the brick. Now, here the, the timber is working very well with this moisture, moisture regulation, but the best one is even the double than the earth, than the timber, it's the earth. So that's why we decided, okay, let's build all the building with bearing walls of earth. So um, the way they were doing them, it was very big ones. Uh, we, it, has, it, it was a very big building, 43 units. And uh, we were worried of all the, the, the capacity because you need auxiliary machine to put this on the place. So that's why we asked them to do it with a, a smaller piece that you can handle with one hand. That means it has to weigh less than four kilos per piece. So uh, we are not very worried of the aesthetics. So we think maybe the aesthetic is part of the result of another kind of conceptual approach. So let's think how to do it in this way. So we were able to put many people working. Uh, is there water? Sorry. Wor working and being able to raise all these labyrinths of, of earth. Okay. So we were raising the building when we covered, we have this idea like caves. And then this, and again, this idea of reducing, you know, uh, in Spain, we are not very well doing 
walls and normally the joints are very well, they're not very well done. So we normally, we try to plaster them to avoid these acoustic breaches. But in this case, we cannot do that because we wanted to take advantage of the hygroscopicity. That's why we decided to polish all the walls with a very fine mortar. And then we were able to make sure that all the joints were totally closed for the acoustics. That's why when you see it's the walls, they are a bit shiny. And the same happens with the floor. You know, the floor is the concrete pulley. So this idea of not adding materials, maybe sometimes subtracting part of the material, it's part of the process. So we don't, we can reduce the amount of layers. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as, as I was telling you, you know, we, we try to reduce not using as less material as possible. You know, five stories of building, and we did it with 20 centimeters of wall, with only with compression. You know, the traction, we solve it through here, okay? Uh, that means that uh, to, in order to do that, because one of the big difficulties is uh, the sum between neighbors when you're doing uh, uh, social uh, housing, uh, we wanted to solve the, the, the noise, uh, the, the aerial acoustics with the law of mass. That means that you need at least 300 kilos by square meter of density of the wall in order to solve it only with one sheet. Because otherwise we have to double the bedding wall and that would be very expensive. So, and so to solve it with one wall, that means that we have 2,000 density of the earth with 20 centimeters, we have 400. We only needed 300. The rest of the walls, we just do it by 10. So just put as less material as possible. This is this idea for us of reducing. And then, when we talk about the slab, this problem that we had to change this, the, the, the slab into concrete instead of doing it with timber, we were very worried about, you know, how to make sustainable concrete. In this case, okay, we thought, okay, let's go back to give geometry to the slab. So every time we can, we can give geometry, we can reduce amount of material. So we made a beams, pre pre precast beams of 10 by 20, it's 80 centimeter with a compressor layer of five centimeters. We have 25 centimeters of a structural section, but the amount of concrete equivalent of a 10 centimeters slab. That means a reduction of a 66% in the amount of concrete. So uh, sometimes we think that materials are the ones that are sustainable, but maybe it's the way we use materials, the ones that make them or not sustainable. So now we have a very light co uh, slab. We cannot use the law of mass. So that means that we have to do a mass spring mass solution. So we add a spring with a, a rock wool, and then we do another layer of concrete to do the second mass. And we, instead of adding a pavement, we just polish it to make the finish. And then we make the isolation with the cork and we plaster it with lime and trying to be the more sustainable we could. So this is how we built the, the slabs. The idea of g showing this geometry that also increases the surface of interchange as we wanted to have more inertia. So now we have 1.5 more surface for the interchange of the energy. And then we do this cork isolation, 10 centimeters of cork isolation into all the building. So in some moment the building is totally black and then we plaster it with lime. Okay, sometimes we have to do some plasters with, uh, so some, instead of using plaster boards, we use these boards of clay and then we, it was plastered with clay with a bit of a straw and some of the isolations we use the Posidonia and try not to do slopes with concrete, just with the timber 
and reducing every time reducing materials and outside instead of using concrete trying to use gravels and again reduce the amount of layers instead just to go to this 60 percent of reduction of the emissions of the building and if this is in the project in the 22 ad we try to do a similar a strategy with the concrete in this case we needed to go faster so we use precast concrete in bigger scale but again we don't we we try to compensate moments so that's why we have a layer in situ that is the one that joins everything so that uh, allow us to compensate moments so this is a way of using uh, a prefabricated the, the prefabricates but not to go faster, just to have less amount of concrete. So we have 30 centimeters of structural section and the equivalent of 15 centimeters. It's a reduction of a 50% in emissions in the concrete. So this is the construction. We uh, also increase the surface of interchange and the, this idea that when we finish the, the, the structure, we are able to understand the facade. Okay, and to finish this, the, the, the concept, this idea of sharing. So one of the biggest problems that our society has is loneliness. This is, uh, we can see this in the metro that the worst of getting age was loneliness. Uh, it was in the metro for many years. And you know, it's a problem that we have with the age people. Because, and also we have to understand that we have this inverted population of pyramid, but this is not only happening to aged people. In Japan, we have young people, same problem, otakus, they don't have this social relation, no? And maybe thinking of this idea of the intergenerational housing where you can join a, a young and uh, early people, no? And in the project of the 22 Act, you know, uh, well, we have part of the senior housing, you know, so this is the typology of senior housing with these three holes that makes this relation between the interior and the exterior. And the important thing is that in some moment, this is the typical plan. So here we have a shared space for the community. So all the elderly people, they, they have some activities here. They also can share spaces in the, in the atrium. But one of the things we convince the client to do, one floor with this typology where they share kitchen. So we can have this inter intergenerational situation with a young person and an aged person that they do share kitchen. Each one has their own identity, their own entry, but they can share this space. So this is now very recent photos of this space with, oh sorry, uh, well, with the kitchen. And this is another project that we are working on in the office. This is uh, echo housing. Uh, they, they wanted to share, but th the problem is that they gave them a plot that they have two buildings, but they want to be one community. F uh, we were lucky that we don't need to do parking, so we use the space for the parking just to do the sharing space, so we can enter when we wanted to share, but we can also enter directly if we don't want to share, because this idea of sharing is something that we have to choose. We have to learn how to share. It's not necessary that we share everything. We have to share when we want to share, but sometimes we don't want to share, so we ha are have to be able to give this option. And the nice thing is that uh, in this plot, if you do conventional housing, you will have something like this. It's one there, one bedroom. It's also, it's a cooperative for, for seniors. And we were very aware about this idea of the loneliness, again, this problem of loneliness. And here you can also, you can only have one, two, three, four units per plan. But we told them, okay, they are around 45 square meters. But if you decided not to have all your private space, if you decide to share, you can have 30 square meters, private square meters, plus 50 
shaded square meters. So that means that you can have a bigger house, a house of 80 square meters. And instead of only having four units, we can have five units per plan. So that's the potential of sharing, this idea that it's better, bigger, cheaper. So uh, for us, this is one of the strategies that I, we think that will make more change in the future of architecture. Allowing, so we need to understand how to share. Uh, we think part of the future is going like this. And these are these diagrams, the amount of people you're expected to find. So here only one person because it's your private space, five persons here and 22 here. And again, another thing is that normally in a building like this, south is coming from, from here, you will never put the stair into south. But in this case, as we understand that this is the, 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 the shared terrace, it's facing to south, and as it is a shared space that we want to meet people, it is connected with the stair of the building. Well, so we, we're doing now the project with the uh, block earth. It's very similar technical solutions as the one we were doing in Ibiza. This is, this is the private space that they uh, can also be connected to take care one to another. This is the 50 square meters with the shared, uh, shared uh, terrace. And this is also working uh, as a capture, so we keep the energy. So we, we, we put it after into each one of the units. In the summer, this transforms into a winter a solar chimney here. And also, it allows us to make some ventilation without the noise of the highway that we have close to it. And this is the shared space in the ground floor, in the, the basement. OK, and just. Uh, this is a project we just finished in, Ma in Mallorca. Uh, we, we were using this sandstone, this Mares sandstone, and we were thinking of sharing these uh, streets, being able to build the streets, the, uh, uh, these corridors that they will be a bit wider, uh, more than three meters, to be able to work as streets, as the, like the ones of the... Of, of the municipality. Uh, so even though we have these uh, 42 units, you have the feeling that you are entering two individual units, okay? So this is the, the central street, and the important thing is we also working with these intermediate spaces, the garden and the mineral patio, okay? And also we have this idea of looping, of moving through the communal areas, moving through loops, so we can enter with the bike through here. This is the mineral patio. There's uh, some shared rooms for the community. And the garden, again, a shared space. So increasing this shared space, this is a typology where uh, we decided that the relation with the exterior is through intermediate space. We'll have a lattice to the corridor and a winter garden. And this winter garden, the, this lattice, you can open and have an exterior room. So this is the relation with the exterior, with its intermediate spaces, the lattice, the winter garden, winter garden. And this is the potential of sharing, of understanding that you can open your house and you know what it was supposed to be interior. You have this ex external room, you know, it's be be before this was interior. And you can also appro take appropriation of the corridor, you know, so understanding. So it is this idea of the territoriality that we are very interested in. And, uh, you know, people understand that this, even though it's a communal area, belongs more to the, to the person. And we also, we do like to do these kinds of things, not to finish the kitchen, so they can finish by themselves, no? This idea of the IKEA effect, that even though you, 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 you put yourself that is not orthogonal, you're very happy. So this is what they are more happy when we allow them to make an appropriation of the space. Okay, and just very fast, this concept of new ways of living, Cornellà, 
this idea of making equal rooms. No? We thought, okay, let's think of a plan where all the spaces measure the same. Uh, when things measure the same, things happen, there is no hierarchy. That means that we don't have a bigger room for the parents than for the uh, sons. And there is more, uh, we think it's more democratic and it adapts much better to all the new kinds of easily interchangeable. So you gain flexibility, you gain without hierarchy. In order to do this, because we were very worried of which is the size that a room has to have to be a shared, uh, an equal room for all the spaces, we don't think, you know, then with regulations, single room, six square meters, double room, eight square meters, principal room, 10 square meters. We thought, okay, 10 square meters maybe is not good enough when we want to have a living room or a kitchen with a dining room. Okay, let's understand how which has to be this dimension. So Marta, my partner, she made a PhD about the Japanese house and in Japan, they don't call the spaces because of the use, because they change the use of the space. They call it because of the size. So they have these kinds of rooms that they call the eight tatami room. And it's measuring 360 by 360. It's around 13 square meters. That's the model we use in Cornellà and also the potential of making big openings so that this space you can add it to another. Then we found out that one of the versions of the kitchen of Frankfurt was measuring 350 by 360, and La Petite Cabernon of Le Corbusier was measuring 366 by 366. So we have the most flexible room, the most technical room, and the room for thinking of Le Corbusier. All of them fitted in our system. Then, okay, this is the original scheme of the structure. In that, at this point, we place all the drawings, uh, just taking advantage that all of them they have this cross ventilation making, putting the cores in the corners, okay? And then we have this plan that it is with no hierarchy. You know, it's, it is very difficult to understand which are the limits between the different units and it is very difficult also because even the communal spaces, they do have the same model, okay? And even the stair fits into it, okay? So this is the how it looks, the, these entrances, this idea no, that even though that's a, a, a room, but you can see this enfilade of rooms, so your space, your perception of the space looks bigger than it really measures. Put it in the kitchen in the middle just to visibilize the, the work, the domestic work, and just to fight against the role of gender. Okay, the construction, all the, co the corners, they allow to do the appropriation of the furniture, and you are here in one space where you're able to see four other corners, no? this idea of making big openings, the porosity of the house. Okay, this is something we tried years ago in, in, a in one project we built in Melilla, but it was this concept of the 10 square meter room we were not very satisfied of this size, but it was like one of the first approach that we did this in 2000, it was 2011. Okay, here we, we are this half these corridors, we're talking with the movement of the air and this typology that, you know, we work with the same rooms that when we place it in different ways, we are able to do to, to change the, 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 tipo, the different kinds of facades. And the same in Ibiza, also working with this model, in this case, three by four, and is this idea of the equal rooms, a room for entering. And in this case, the bathrooms is like a furniture in, inside the room. And also we are working with this idea of going around like a core, having rooms with two doors that can allow us to increase the size of the house, the precision of house of house, and try to do houses with no corridors. Okay, and just the last concept, this idea for the parkings, the ones you visited yesterday, the building you saw this concept of the resilience of the parkings. This is the project of Bon Pastor where we tried to do natural ventilation, natural lighting into the parking, 
And the nice thing is that, okay, we, we have this, com this concept that we are building, we think that with the new ways of mobility, uh, the new technologies, you know, the automatic car that drives itself, it will be a reality in 10, 20 years, but this building will last 100 years. The automatic car will never park under our buildings. It will be going around the city, and then we will use a pla an app, it will co come to pick us. So we are building spaces now that in 20 years make no sense. So this is the plan that we did it for the regulations. One parking plot for, for each one of the units, but the one we were thinking in reality was this one, you know, entering with the bike, parking your bike here, and then you have these spaces, you know, these locals that we, you will have like a garden with light and then thinking of the resilience of these spaces. This is also that in the project of that you visited yesterday in Masno, we also did it in this case with two plants. We made like all this argument of what's the, the, the oldness of the air and which is the movement of the air to allow us to do this the second level of the parking, to allow us you know, to have like this quality into the parkings. Well, thank you very much. I, we always finish with this sentence of Chillida. We will pass the microphone, who, whoever would like to have a question. Hello, um, thank you very much for coming here. Um, so I would like to know, um, so in this old topic of um, social housing building, um, is there in any way uh, this approach of um, social housing not being um, built as a new building and maybe um, take advantage of um, an existing building, like we all have in mind the approach that like Antonio Basal did with this exterior um, gallery. So I feel like in public competitions, maybe here in Spain, like in, in terms of um, social housing, it's all about um, new buildings maybe. And I think there's also this um, thing of um, also sustainability uh, of maybe the city, because building new buildings mean people is going to live outside the city and the um, center of the city maybe it's um, be forgotten somehow, so. Okay, the, the difficulty we have here in Spain for this is that in the 50s or 60s, we have this law of horizontal owners, and the property of the buildings is divided in many individual owners. So in order to do one of these kinds of renovations, you need to put in, uh, they, they have to agree to in order to do this. Only with one saying no, you're not able to do it. In France, La Catona Basal, they don't have, they, when, uh, when, whenever they did this, the owners is the municipality of the buildings and they can do these renovations in this sense. But it's one of the greatest deals with the, that we have. I always say that the renovation of the future, uh, the existing buildings has a lot to do, you know, La uh, Catona and Basal, they did it like this, and I think you have to do it uh, from up to down and from down to up. So. Because we, there are two s things that are happening. That we can take advantage of the coverings. We can do green gardens in the covering. We can do some strategies in the coverings. But at the same time, we have, have this changing of the ground floor. You know, the ground floor is not commercial anymore. Amazon has come to here and everything has changed. And we are trying to fight against this. But instead of thinking that maybe this is an opportunity, to make this renewable 
and having some part of these sharing spaces. You know, whenever we are doing these super blocks, but instead of understanding that maybe the green has to be beside the facade, because we are we don't have a ground commercial anymore, because you know the logics of walking through the facade has a lot to do with having commercial. But the reality is that in the future there will not be commercial in the ground floor. And this is one of the opportunities that we have, and I think maybe one of the strategies is going in this sense. Well, uh, about your specific question, I have to say that it's obvious that we can think about it. But maybe the circumstances are not so... Um, uh, doesn't make easy that approach, at least in terms of social housing. Uh, what you have seen, basically, is the result of public competitions. So we come into the competitions that are open and are interested in high quality in terms of architecture. But I have to say that there's a lot of competition that are uh, concerned and involved in the idea of uh, renovation of social housing. But are competitions that are basically concerned about uh, the, f the energy rescue. And in general, are that kind of competitions are not saying that are all those kinds of competitions, but uh, most of them are not really or they think that this is not about architecture, it's just about of energy. This is a dualistic approach that we don't agree. But when you are in front of, the, of that kind of competitions that you think that they are not giving much value to our specific approach, in fact, we don't do that kind of competitions. But competitions to get, uh, and there's, well, in fact, there's one that is going on that is quite interesting in the center of Barcelona in order to have an energetic rescue also involved with, ar with architecture. But I think that it's a, mm, and I have to say that there's more social housing in the rest of Europe than here. So it's just also a question of, of percentage of, uh, so the question I think that it's going on, maybe I'm sure that the strategies that yeah. Jose Manuel are talking I d are the proper. I think you had another question. Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. They're both great, um, really interesting. I, yeah, you did kind of answer it. It's very quick fire questions for Jose. Um, that one where you've got the, uh, well, firstly, it's who pays for this? I know that they're competitions, uh, which is why I think that's how you just answered it. So your budget will be in there. But you use really, you use limited and uh, yeah, re you reduce the number of materials you use, but your finishes are expensive. Um, like they look, you, you use lime mortar, for example, which is obviously long term cheaper because it's better for permeability, but it's short term a much more expensive material than um, cement mortar. But then the other question was just about your circulation in the building there. You've got the layers and then the circulation on the outside, and you had refugees, um, yeah. students, and then. Rental? Yeah, and then, uh, and then, and then elderly. Senior. And then you had those communal spaces. I was just going to ask, do you have access on to all those communal spaces or are they individualized by your floor? They are individualized each floor because they wanted separate buildings. Yeah. We give them a unique building, but they ask us for separate buildings. But we convince them that they can, even they separate, they can look to each other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the cost of the projects uh, is not more than the rest of the, you know, we, and whenever we do a competition, we have a budget, and that's the one that we respect. Uh, but sometimes when uh, you, in whenever, if you don't need to do active systems, there is an amount of the budget that you don't need to have, and then you can spend this into another places. And you know, for us, as I told you, the economic, it's very clue. And you know, every time we, we every decision when that we take, we understand which is the cost and which is the simpler way. And we also work with a company, uh, the, uh, the economy of a scale. That means that uh, we try not to do many decisions into a building. So mm -hmm. the big repetition of, you know, if we are using brick, then we go all with brick. So that makes it's cheaper to f to make the brick and also to put it in place. And this economy of scale is one of the strategies. But uh, we don't 
we, we, we can do this with the same amount of money as the rest. Yeah, we have another question here. Okay. <laughs> Um, my question was maybe a bit similar to Saskia's because um, I see that you have uh, a lot of shared spaces in the buildings that you show. Um, but if this is social housing, how do you convince a client to have that much shared spaces as these are not spaces that they can rent out anymore? Because um, I know that in Belgium, for example, these shared like hallways and stuff that they may try to make it as small as possible so they can have a lot more space that they can rent out and they can maybe fit in an extra apartment somewhere. So I'm wondering like what are the arguments that can convince social housing um, developers to not have that extra apartment but have more uh, shared spaces, for example? Okay, in our case, uh the relation of the surface that you can sell and the, the surface uh, that you built, it's never less than 75%. Many of the shared spaces that we do are coverings, you know, when you enter in Cornellan, you have the part that is a shared space on coverings, and we, we make circulations, maybe these strategies of making some terrace situations are very uh, optimistic for this because uh, other you will always need to do a covering. So whenever you have a covering, if this is a shared space, uh, it is it doesn't have a cost of a, an extra. So uh, having this idea of sometimes uh, terracing the building, it's a very cheap way to do communal space. Uh, only having an exterior space and then you only give them a room and only with the room and the exterior space. So, but I, it looks like that we uh, spend the space into shared space, but they don't allow us to do this. Well, th there's something else that you have to not not all the not all the council norms uh, approach the same about how you have to count the this surface in terms of the surface that you can spend in construction. I mean, that there's some situations that this surface uh, that could be a shared space is not part of the maximum surface that you can build. Then it's easier when you're not wasting or, or uh, using part of the surface that is uh, supposed that it's going to be indoor surface and private surface. It's true that it's not always like this, but it's an important part of the, of the equation. The other thing is that you're, uh, again, coming to the same, you're looking the results of competitions for very specific promoters. Not all the promoters have the same philosophy about certain kind of spaces. So uh, it's our case that, for example, uh, we, we really take care about what the one who promotes this competition. And if they really are aware and they are really sensible, not only about the idea of sharing a space, but about the idea of, uh, I don't know, whatever, uh, new typologies. I mean, architecture has uh, two different ways to, 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 to deal with the two big issues that we have in front of us, uh, ecological crisis and social justice. In terms of the ecological crisis, more or less, I think that we mostly agree that we have to develop thermodynamical strategies, biospherical materials, reduction, and so on and so on. But in front of the social, we have to be, uh, as architects, dealing with the idea of new typologies, new ways of living, new ways of relation, new ways uh, to introduce the idea of sharing a space. And of course, the same in the private, the same in the public, not everybody is ready or really want to, to develop that kind of competition. So in fact, yeah, the, the competitions, the promoters are all also part of the people who really are committed to develop these new kind of spaces. So congratulations for the both presentations were really interesting. I'm, I'm very interest, 
in, in, uh, in the idea of shared spaces, and I would like to know if you have, um, if, you, if the, the, the spaces overcome your expectations in terms of appropriation, so how the inhabitants react to these spaces, how do they appropriate these spaces, because of course you show us uh, empty spaces still, so I would like to know how these spaces are really lived uh, in, in reality, or you know, if they really overcome your expectations as a designer, as an architect. Thank you. Uh, uh, we are really happy of how they are, but uh, we are learning a lot every time we, we uh, every time we finish a building, we go and visit it, you know, and the way people, they appropriate the space, you know, when, and it is this, uh, for it is important for us the indetermination, if, th when you don't really know if it's interior or exterior, this idea of the Casals painting, you know, this, this ambiguity of the spaces is the one that works better. And, but also uh, we think we are learning that uh, territoriality is one of the best concepts. So sometimes we have to put a line to understand which, which is the limit between uh, more private and, and public. Uh, uh, but whenever we, we've visited, uh, it has much uh, overcome or ex expectations. And there are many of these atoms, you will think maybe they will be very noisy and they're really quiet. I don't know why, but they have people have the feeling <laughs> that these kinds of spaces are like different and they, 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 they behave different in these kinds of spaces. I have to say that maybe our experience in social housing and big communities is uh, far less than Jose Manuel experience. In our case, we are a little bit aware about this kind of shared spaces when the shared space has a um, is not part of this uh, continuous of spaces from the very public to the very private. I mean, that in our opinion, uh, by the moment, in our own experience, this kind of uh, su spaces are successful when it's part or related to the common circulations of the building. Because at least you have the, you can be sure that people will mix together, will meet together in these continuous spaces. Spaces uh, that are shared and are just for sharing, I have mm -hmm. to say that there's beautiful and amazing experience. If you go to, to La Borda experience here in Barcelona, you will see fantastic, really specific spaces to be shared in terms of cooking, in terms of laundry, and so on. But for example, for the people who come yesterday to the housing in the university, it's far more successful the garden and the terrace that is part of the transitions uh, than the laundry mm -hmm. or the seating that they have to watch TV together. Okay, so, I mean, it's more or less successful, but what is, it really, uh, or in the final project I've shown in Gaba, it's a, there's a, there's a garden, there's a big lobby, there's a, there's a lot of uh, intermediate spaces between the apartment and the street but it's part of a circulation. Then you are for sure that as your door no, is not just in front of the street, so to arrive to your door, you have to be through a large series of shared spaces. I think that you have a minimum idea of successful because it's gonna be shared for sure. I'm not so sure that when you are with 140 families, uh, the it, it's our own experience, I have to say. I mean, you have deal with more communities and with large communities, by the moment we have checked that it, it works when it's about circulation, transitions, and so on. Yeah. Uh, no, it is important. The, for us, the, we think we have to learn how to share. And not everything has to be shared by all. You know, this idea, no, no, the room for 100 families will never work. Maybe a garden will work for a hundred families. So we, that's why we have to understand that maybe we have to put a laundry in each one of the floors instead of one. So uh, we have to try different things 
and try to understand, uh, to learn. Uh, we have to learn as uh, of architects, and the users have also to learn. But there are very successful experiences in 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 Switzerland, in Zurich, and we we just have to learn. And you know, we are very happy with the project of the senior the co the cooperative of seniors that I show you because this is an experience we have talked a lot with them and they they want to share but they want to share in different scales not everything is shared by everyone okay is there any other question i also from that side because i'm only in this side The button, the button, please. Press, press the button, press. It has to be green. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask um, about more of the formal decisions that you take on how to control these spaces and these transition spaces, because a lot of the things that we are seeing in projects nowadays is a lot of glass and curtain systems and different possibilities of different layers of different walls which are all very straightforward structural approaches constructive approaches um, are there some more let's say for example volumetric um, ways to modify or how do you formally um, influence the, be the behavior of the people in those kinds of spaces in your practice um, well uh, I was explained that when you make terrace terraces, you're able to use a covering as a shared space. So this is a volumetric strategy that affects the behavior of people. And, you know, in the case of Ibiza, we were very worried of the scale of the building in relation to the place. So we have to relate with the hotels that have a big scale, but also with the scale of uh, small houses. So we took the scale of the small houses, we attached them together in a volumetric they were uh, and that also allow us to have many a very deep uh, uh, typology and that allow us to have many corners and every time we have a vertex we generate a vortex and there is movement of the air and there is always this relation of the shape of the city into the building but i think in the explanation in my case i told you there was more the concepts than all the small decisions. But it is important also, for, for sure, totally, no. I, I haven't got much of a question. I mean. I'll try to explain my, my thinking a bit better. Um, so a lot of the times when we are seeing projects that are constructed nowadays that deal with these typologies of shared and semi-transmittable, semi-permittable spaces. Um, I feel like a lot what I'm seeing from those projects, from the technical solutions, is a glass panel, a curtain, or some vegetation. A lot of repeatedness in um, trying to control how the people occupy those spaces and the level of privacy. So I was just seeing if you have a maybe a more interesting approach to share with us. <laughs> <laughs> a more innovative method, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, maybe you tell us in front, uh, in based in what you've seen. I don't know, maybe w we share these uh, strategies. Uh, at least in our case, it's not exactly about uh, how people perform. This is important, but it's not, uh, I think it's important. I mean, it's possible to imagine or to project the experience of people in front of the attributes of architecture, not exactly how they react or how they perform a social event. Um, but of course, to give them, to give people support for whatever activity in, this ki in that kind of intermediate space, uh, in that kind of shared or not shared, but intermediate space. It's for sure good in terms of non non programmed activities uh, with low cost, uh, sustainable in terms that works with thermodynamics and so on. So um, I think that more or less, there's lots of examples, our examples, uh, different examples that basically are based on that. 
For me, it's important, as what I've said or I was trying to explain, that it uh, doesn't matter the specific strategies, but are strategies based in architectonical decisions, not about the efficiency of a machine or about uh, engineering decisions in order to waste less energy or whatever. So it doesn't matter exact, exactly how, but what I think is important is that we as architects, we approach that kind of issues as architects taking architectonical decisions. In our case, what we try is maybe sometimes we need curtains, maybe we sometimes we need uh, greenery or whatever. But what we try is that most of the attributes that defines this experience in whatever kind of a space are based in the attributes of the structure. Why? Because the structure is the most permanent part of, of a building. Then, if the structure is not only what supports human activity, but what defines the geometry of the activity, but what helps in order to keep the temperature as stable as possible, and what also helps to control humidity because of the kind of material, and, 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 then, as Peter Brook could say, uh, something convincing happens. Something convincing happens when, when the most permanent part of the building is what defines most of the attributes of the experience, at least is what we try. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question because we would like to go <coughs> after we finish this session to the Congress Hall where we have a small exhibition and you are invited to, to take a drink. So just to keep some energy in time for that. Uh, last question, maybe. Can you pass me the microphone, please? Thank you. Any other question? Okay, so then I think uh, thank you very much again. Thank you.